Destruction in the streets of Ferguson this morning. Rioting protesters are that they, they have to put tear gas in response. They say. Grand jury deciding not to indict. Police car on fire. You can see them trying to more tear gas. And it'll make for good TV. Hello, I'm Richard Gisbert, and you're at the Listening Post. Here are some of the media stories we've been tracking this week. Ferguson, Missouri, round two. We cover the coverage of race in America. The Philippines, where journalism can make you a target, where bearing witness can get you killed. We take a close-up look at something that many of us never consider, but every media organization thinks about carefully, fonts and some digital life coaching. It could form into this accepted form of digital insanity. Delivered online. Three months ago, when the riots broke out in Ferguson, Missouri, many journalists, including Americans, had to reach for their maps. This past week, they knew where they were going. The news media were already camped out for days, in some cases weeks, before a grand jury decided not to indict the policeman who had shot and killed an unarmed black teenager named Michael Brown. The news coverage of the second wave of riots in Ferguson has been wall-to-wall, -wall, which is a departure from the American media's apparent reluctance to examine long-standing issues relating to race that apply not just in Missouri, but across the United States. If, as Martin Luther King once said, a riot is the language of the unheard, then this week's unrest in Ferguson shouted the largely untold story of the disproportionate number of deaths among black Americans at the hands of police forces that ostensibly are there to serve and protect. One place where the reporting never seems to end is on social media, in particular on Twitter, the medium of choice for young black Americans expressing their frustration and telling their own stories. And they're not the only ones critical of the coverage of what's happening in Ferguson. The prosecutor involved, the White House, everyone seems to have issues with the media frenzy that's surrounding this case. This time around, the protests have spread beyond Ferguson to many American cities, but our starting point is what used to be an anonymous suburb of St. Louis, Missouri. Some members of the media and some protesters have had clashes. Inside, whether it's... Ah. That can happen when it starts to feel like the media is there to be predatory. People are throwing stuff at me right now. So they're looking at the media and they're saying, you're here, now what? Now, Stephanie, get to safety. Are you going to actually do something? Are you going to help us? Is your presence doing anything for our community? Man, you All right, we heard that. Or are you just more vultures here to feed on our pain and leave? Uh, to make sure that... A president as media savvy as this one might have known, maybe should have known, that by the time he went on television urging calm, he would be sharing the screen with images of a Missouri suburb on fire, the flames fighting, undercutting his message. That may have been why he chose to weigh in on the media side of this story. Uh, there is inevitably going to be some negative reaction, and it'll make for good TV. The inference drawn, intended or not, was that what was unfolding on television screens might be skewing or exaggerating what was unfolding in Ferguson. I thought it was strange that Obama brought up the media in his statement. There's a story, obviously, to be told about how the media covers this topic. Uh, I don't think it's, it's Obama's role um, at that time to be commenting on it, and I don't really understand how this makes for good TV. I mean, when people in St. Louis are watching what's happening on TV, their hearts are breaking. This is not good for anybody except for a very you know, small number of, of television producers and journalists themselves who are using this for ratings. Yes, of course, uh, this will make good TV. TV. And uh, I think that uh, one of the problems with the way this was handled was that the announcement was made at a time that was seen to be guaranteed to draw people into the streets uh, producing images of violence. It was done at night instead of on a Sunday morning or another tr more tranquil time. The prosecutor in the case, Bob McCullough, made the announcement that the white policeman would not be put on trial for killing Michael Brown. On the media, he went further than the president did. The most significant challenge encountered in this investigation has been the 24-hour news cycle and its insatiable appetite for something, for anything, to talk about, following closely behind with the nonstop rumors on social media. 
I think it was a way for him to delegitimize the breakthroughs that both social media and uh, regular news media have made. I mean, this story emerged uh, essentially through Twitter, through social media. That's where I first saw it. Um, I saw an Instagram shot of Michael Brown's body lying on the ground well before this had made the papers. And it was through uh, social media and black social media that this story spread and that a lot of evidence um, in this story, including eyewitness testimony, was put together by the public. So of course McCullough, you know, wants to de-emphasize that and make that seem as irrelevant as possible. I think it's in his interest to not want social media, the, the level of social media that we saw. Social media and the internet is the best friend of the truth. And it's because of the millions and millions of tweets, the millions and millions of posts, that the story of Ferguson even became a mass media story. So I think that his antagonism towards the role social media has played uh, makes sense, given his position and his role in the case. During round one of the Ferguson story, in the heat of the Missouri summer, social media did lead, and mainstream media followed. The images went out on Twitter and other platforms, followed by the links, the hashtags, the organizing. This time, the mainstream media were in place for the news event, the prosecutor's announcement, and for the unrest that followed. But not much else has changed. I would say that round one, they seemed to be a little confused that people were this upset. Now they get why people are upset. They understand what's been happening, especially in terms of how the police treated the media in those first few days. They understood that if this is how you're treating someone wearing a press badge, how you're treating other people must be immeasurably worse when the cameras aren't here. So I think there was a certain amount of that. I do think, unfortunately, some press chose to focus on the possibility of violence to the exclusion of focusing on the lack of justice. What we have is a consolidated media owned by a handful of corporations um, and that with the profit motive. So you can sell sensationalism, you can sell stories about looting and crime, episodic and in, in, in incidental stories much more easily than you can sell stories about history or that provide context or that tell a real story. We want freedom, freedom. Every 28 hours, a, a black person is killed by a police officer. Black youth are 21 times more likely to be killed by a police officer than white youth. Those are not stories that sell, but they are the truth. And so when you have a media that's been as consolidated as it is, people turn to the Internet. They turn to an open Internet to be able to tell a story that is unable to be told in mass media. Which partly explains why Twitter's heat map on Ferguson looked like this the night the prosecutor announced the decision, with just a fraction of the tweets coming from Missouri and the Midwest. The story was boiling over on both coasts as well. And despite the fact that not all activists on the streets of Ferguson like the coverage they're getting in the U.S. mainstream media, complaining those news outlets focus too much on the unrest and not what led to it, at least the journalists are there this time and have been from the start. One of the benefits of having situations like Ferguson highlighted in the media is that it gives us an opportunity to talk about how fair is the criminal justice system? If we take lessons from what's happened in Ferguson and similar situations, I think we can find the silver linings and move forward to having a more equitable society. And that's one of the functions of the news media, frankly, is to, is to make, <laughs> make it better for everybody. When you look at coverage, this is not the result of, you know, benevolence on the part of news outlets. This is the direct result of one, a, a massive uproar on social media, two, organized interventions to change the story, and three, journalists themselves being harmed by militarized policing. And when you put all that together, what you have is a situation in which journalists and news outlets have expanded their frame for the story, and that's a beautiful thing. On the download this week, our viewers weigh in on black Twitter and other aspects of the coverage of the story coming out of Ferguson. Even after mainstream media arrived in Ferguson back in August, black bloggers and activists and tweeters were online critiquing and correcting their stories. And I think that one of the greatest new lessons that these last few months have taught me is that mainstream media's portrayal of events or racial implications simply can't be trusted.
the media has a responsibility to cover issues and events, but they're obliged to do so responsibly. The media's role is to dissect the issues and to help the American people to make sense of the protesters' reaction. The people of Ferguson do not feel like they got justice through the courts. And from my perspective, neither have they got justice through the media. Other media stories that are on our radar this week as the trial over the murder of 32 journalists in the Philippines proceeds, the list of potential witnesses is growing shorter. A fourth would-be witness in the case has been shot dead, another badly wounded. The massacre took place five years ago in the province of Maguindanao, and at least 108 members of a powerful political group known as the Ampatuan clan are facing charges which they deny. Prosecutors say the Ampatuans targeted some of their political opponents and the journalists were just caught up in the crossfire. Police are saying that the witness killed Denik Sakal was a former member of the Ampatuan group but was prepared to testify against it. Meanwhile, on November 23rd, Filipino and foreign reporters held a vigil in Manila for their murdered colleagues. They demanded an end to impunity for those killing journalists. In the almost 30 years since the fall of the Marcos government in 1986, an average of three Filipino media workers have been killed per year. A legal process is now underway in China. On trial, a journalist charged with revealing state secrets. The journalist is named Guo Yu, and the case appears to hinge on a government policy paper known as Document 9, which warns against creeping democratic values in China, including freedom of the press. Guo revealed the document in a paper called Mirror Monthly, which is published outside China. It was also reported by many other local newspapers. Six months ago, the state broadcaster CCTV aired a report apparently showing Guo confessing to the charges. However, her lawyer says she was under duress at the time, after her son was arrested. The trial began November 21st. It's being held behind closed doors. Journalists have been prevented from getting anywhere near the building. In a related development, Chinese journalists have been sent back to school assigned to attend university lectures. The Communist Party's Liaoning Daily Newspaper sent reporters to observe more than 100 classes at at least 20 universities. The paper then published an article encouraging lecturers to speak more positively about China, accusing some of blackening the country and exaggerating problems of corruption and social inequality. The man once known as the Iranian blog father has been released from prison in Tehran six years into a 19-year jail term. Hossein Derekshan, an Iranian-Canadian, sent out a tweet November 20th saying, pardoned by Ayatollah Khomeini, freed from prison finally after six years last night. Derek Shan made his name just as the Iranian blogosphere was exploding in size by encouraging his fellow citizens to make their voices heard online. Then, in 2008, he defied an Iranian law that banned citizens from traveling to Israel. He used his Canadian passport to go there. He blogged at the time. He was just trying to find some common ground between the two countries. However, the authorities in Tehran did not buy that. They jailed him for, quote, spreading propaganda, conspiring with hostile governments, and creating and managing obscene websites. It is not yet clear if Derek Shan's pardon affects his original sentence, which included a five-year ban on all political and journalistic activities upon his release. The way we consume news can be influenced by the way that information is presented, how it's edited, the choice of images to illustrate the accompanying text, and the choice of typeface itself. For most people, fonts may seem inconsequential. However, if you ran a newspaper, a television station, or an online outlet, you'd soon realize that the font that you choose is key to the message you want to convey. Because in the process of storytelling, fonts are used to set the tone and project authority. And in a world where news can be agenda-laden, where information is often being framed in a particular way, something as subtle as the choice of a typeface plays a central role in that framing. The Listening Post's Marcella Pizarro now on the use of fonts in the news media. Usually when people ask me, are you, what do you do? And I say, I'm a typeface designer. And like, what is that? And like, do we really need more fonts? But yes, because it's the voice and we have different things to say. Imagine a world where all fonts were the same, where words wore a uniform, where letters spoke in monotone. The local newsstand would look a whole lot duller. If you go to a newspaper kiosk, you might see five different newspapers there. A person who is just a regular reader, a regular citizen, 
with no knowledge of newspaper design or typography will be able to tell you this newspaper is down market. This newspaper is for people perhaps with less education who would like the thrill uh, of murder stories, a little sex, uh, um, a little of this, a little of that, sensationalism. Then you gravitate towards newspapers like The Guardian in London, The New York Times, The Wall Street Journal, The Zeit, The Frankfurter Allgemeine in Germany, and all of them in 10 seconds tell you, come here to read. We are serious, gravitas. How do you do that? Without reading one word, typography. In 10 seconds, the typography conveys all kinds of things to people without having read a word. Here's another way to look at it. Imagine the New York Times masthead changed from NYT Cheltenham to Papyrus, or BBC screen furniture revamped in Hobo, or the Hindu in Brush Script. It doesn't quite have the same feel to it. That's because fonts don't just house words, they can affect their meaning. If you look at your regular local newspapers, be it the New York Times, Hindi newspaper, Le Figaro in France, and you presented those newspapers in an unfamiliar typeface, your understanding would be highly confused. It's like you suddenly talking in a different accent, and it might mean I'd be thinking about what you're saying in a very different way. So there's a sort of invisibility to the choice of fonts, and you become used to associating certain kinds of voice with certain kinds of typefaces. When you pick up a newspaper, when you turn on the TV station, uh, you want to be able to believe what this agency is telling you. So there is that trust factor that you have to build in, and the typefaces have to perform on that subconscious level, so that when you are reading, you are believing. There are some fonts that provoke more of a reaction than others. Two months ago, one of Australia's oldest newspapers did something that had the world of typographers pounding their keyboards. The Sydney Morning Herald published a front page story in Comic Sans, the font some have called a crime against design. Thousands took to Twitter to scoff at the 183-year-old Daily's design decision. It wouldn't be the first time Comic Sans was the target of the public's wrath. Since its birth 20 years ago, the font has suffered from an almost universal disdain, complete with a campaign to ban it. Comic Sans, in, in a sense, I equate it to fashion. I mean, if you see Lady Gaga appearing, some people will think, oh my God, this is a, the fashion that I would like to wear. And then somebody else would say, my God, who is dressing this woman? Why is she appearing like this? And so it's the same with type. There are people who believe that this is not a font, that this is, should not be considered typography. I think that there is a place for Comic Sans. And I have never used it myself, but perhaps the opportunity will come for me to use it. Why not? <laughs> I think it was Comic Sans was, you know, some designers are more sensitive to it than others. I don't use it. Uh, but it doesn't make me uncomfortable that it exists. I think variety in design is good. Ever since the 15th century, when a German entrepreneur called Johannes Gutenberg invented the printing press, which made publishing on a mass scale possible for the first time, typographers have been designing letters and numbers because one font does not fit them all. Today, another revolution is underway, the digital one. Different platforms mean different requirements, and that means different design demands for people who are in a bigger hurry now than they ever were. Today, we are in the midst of what I call the media quartet. You have the phone, you have the tablet, you have the, the online, and you have the print. It's 24 hours, it's the journalism of interruptions. People want the news when it's happening. Typography is going to become extremely important in how you present stories in these platforms. And so you have to adapt to interruptions, you have to adapt to quick glances, and bolder type, sans serif type will do better for these glances than type that is a little bit more difficult to, to tell the difference between the nuances between the letters. So that's a real challenge starting right now. A challenge for designers creating fonts in Latin script, but for the multitude of countries that rely on calligraphic script, creating standardized, nationally recognized fonts is even more of a challenge. Think of the billion people who get their information in Mandarin, 
the 260 million who speak Hindi and read in Devanagari script, 160 million Russians and 11 million Greeks who read in Cyrillic. In the age of the digital revolution, Latin font may be hegemonic, but it's not representative, and many countries are starved for new typefaces. Unfortunately, there are other languages where the creation of fonts is minimal. And I'm always interested in seeing how young designers who know that language, type designers, would come and create more font because there are many languages, lesser used languages around the world, where there are not many fonts available for those languages. And that is, that is sad. One of the big challenges when it, came to, when it comes to Arabic typography uh, you know, in the Arab world, we have this very rich calligraphic heritage. But then there was this big break because you jump into our modern times and you look at the digital fonts, and all of a sudden that rich heritage was not uh, properly translated to today's. Uh, so the biggest challenge when it came to Arabic uh, fonts is really quantity. Uh, that has started to change very recently because brands have been aware that they need to have a, a visual distinct personality as part of their branding. What's happening in the world right now, and it's affecting our languages and the way we speak and the way we design our languages, is that it's becoming globally generic. When it becomes globally generic, you lose local complexity. And in fact, it's the interest of raw generics to replace local complexity. So I think the real challenge for us is to preserve that, to look for what heritage has led to a certain kind of language and go back and try and reinforce and capture that. Because it's not just in the content of words that meaning is generated, it's also in their form. And although good journalism is ultimately about the facts, it's not just the literal meaning of the words that convey the truth. Among our voices on the download now, a couple of designers from the Americas on fonts and how to use them. The choice of fonts in a news publication is probably the most important decision to make. It, it will not only bind the corporate identity together, but it is also the main tool that the publication uses to communicate with the readers. So the fonts are making a statement even before you start reading the news. The fonts are saying, I am this kind of publication. The choice of typeface by a publication does affect the experience of its readers. Uh, it makes a big difference towards how easy it is to read as well as the credibility they have uh, to the audience. There probably isn't a single good news font. Uh, picking one is usually a product of the sort of constraints they might have, uh, such as whether it's a digital or print publication, uh, type of content, as well as the kind of image that they're trying to portray to the audience. Finally, on this program, we often tell stories that chronicle just how the internet, social media, and smartphones have changed our lives. That's all well and good. However, progress often comes at a price because a lot of us have decided that it's okay to hide behind screens, text speak, and emoticons instead of engaging with humanity directly. So we've chosen a video that's been making the rounds from a rapper named Prince Ia. He calls it, Can We Autocorrect Humanity? It's his digital manifesto that warns against the effects of technology that can consume us. It's had nearly 8 million hits on YouTube, proof that a lot of us need to get out more. We'll see you next time here at The Listening Post. Did you know the average person spends four years of his life looking down at his cell phone? Kinda ironic, ain't it? How these touch screens can make us lose touch. But it's no wonder in a world filled with iMacs, iPads, and iPhones, so many eyes, so many selfies, not enough us's and we see. Technology has made us more selfish and separate than ever. Cause while it claims to connect us, connection has gotten no better. What about me? Do I not have the patience to have conversation without abbreviation? This is the generation of media overstimulation. Chats have been reduced to snaps. The news is 140 characters. Videos are six seconds at high speed. And you wonder why ADD is on the rise faster than 4G LTE. But get a load of this. Studies show the attention span of the average adult today is one second lower 
than that of a goldfish.